Hey Sky fam, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Becca, I'm a Seattle-based flight attendant. And today I have a very special video that's been highly requested in the past, which is a one year reflection on mainline versus regional airline flying. And now that I've spent a year at both places, I wanna give a little recap of how it's been going, um, do a little comparison of the differences, pros and cons to each, and give you guys my take and my experience on how everything has been going. This video is gonna be broken up into five parts. We are going over first some misconceptions about regional flying and regional versus mainline flying. Then we're gonna go into depth on my training experience at both airlines. Uh, then we're gonna talk about the IOEs or OEs, which are your operating experiences, which is kind of tied into training. Fourth, we're gonna talk about benefits, pros and cons to each types of airline. And lastly, the fifth part is my one year reflection. And before we get right into the video, I also wanna take a moment and say, congratulations guys for discovering my channel, sticking around and subscribing. Um, today actually marks, today is May 16th, and today marks the one year channel anniversary, channel anniversary of my channel and I cannot emphasize enough how happy I am that I started recording my vlogs, recording my experience, whether that be you watching my flight attendant vlogs or just my daily life. Um, this channel has been a really special project for me and I wanna keep growing it. I wanna have an established community here on YouTube. And uh, with that being said, if you are not already subscribed, which 79% of my viewers are not subscribed, please consider doing so or liking, commenting, sharing my videos with someone that you know that might enjoy them. It means a lot to me and I wanna grow this Sky Fam as, as big as it can be. So thank you guys again for sticking around for the one year anniversary of the channel. With that being said, let's get right into the video. First, we're gonna talk about some misconceptions between regional and mainline airlines. And it's really interesting to me because I hear from the general public when I was flying regional, they just don't actually understand what that word means because they just assume regional just means you're flying small town to small town flying and that is not the case. Even other crew members in the industry look down on regionals for whatever reason and they don't consider them as good or good enough as a mainline, which is not the case. I genuinely don't think a lot of people understand the differences between the two because it's not like one is top dog and the other is crap. That's not how it is at all. So to get started, and the regional model is also kind of a newer model to begin with. So I think there is a lot of misinformation out there about what it is. So there are a couple different types of regional airlines. Um, there are some that are wholly owned subsidiary companies to their mainline counterparts. So for example, this would be like Envoy for American Airlines, Endeavor Air for Delta Airlines, or Horizon Air for Alaska Airlines. So those are wholly owned by their mainline, bigger company uh, mainline. Then you also have some that are operated largely through contracted carriers. So I can finally say it, my previous employer was SkyWest Airlines and they are a contracted carrier for the four different main lines. So SkyWest works with United, American, Delta, and Alaska, and does those four carriers regional flying through contracts. So uh, United Airlines as operated by SkyWest Airlines. So if you've ever seen that operated by like a different carrier on your boarding pass, you've actually been on a regional flight. So that's something I wanted to clarify. Some people assume that regionals only do short flights, like little puddle jumper flights, which is not true. Yes, there of course are short flights, but I was Denver based my entire time and the longest flight I did was four and a half hours from Denver to Savannah, Georgia. So that is not true. Also the misconception that regionals only, like I said earlier, regionals only go from small towns to small towns. That is not true. Regionals exist to connect people to bigger cities. So some of the most popular layovers I had were in San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, Houston. I had really big city layovers. So it would really grind my gears when people would just assume, oh, if you're a regional flight attendant, 
you don't have good layovers. That is not true at all. There's also one truth, which is regional airlines do fly smaller jets. If you're a passenger and you think you're flying, I don't know, let's say United, for example, you think maybe you're on a 777 or I don't know, just like a really big jet and then you turns out you're on a small CRJ 700 or CRJ 900 with two flight attendants and you're like, oh, I don't have any room for my bags in the overhead bin. Well, yes, regional airlines do use smaller jets. That is true. And I used to get comments all the time of watch your head. They're, uh, wow, these overhead bins are small. Oh geez, my seat is right next to the toilet. Like I used to get those comments all the time, which is really annoying. But yes, regionals do typically fly regional jets, which are smaller jets. One thing that might be kind of confusing because, which makes sense because with my previous regional, we were operating as other carriers. So my training and my manual taught me the different services and basic requirements of those four different carriers. But that being said, mainline crews or mainline flight attendants specifically and regional flight attendants do not intermix. So even though I was a regional flight attendant, let's say I was operating United Express, which I often did based out of Denver, I would not ever actually be flying with United mainline flight attendants even though maybe our scarves look the same or different uniform pieces look the same, you, uh, the two are not intermixed because my company was actually SkyWest, or my employer was actually SkyWest Airlines. So I'm sure if you're just the regular person at the airport and you see one flight attendant in the same uniform as another, you would assume that they're flying together, but that's not true. Regional flight attendants do not fly with mainline flight attendants. There's no intermixing of the two groups. I hope that that clarified uh, any misconceptions that you may be previously held about mainlines versus regionals. If you have more questions about the two, leave them down below and I'll try my best to clarify um, because it can be kind of a confusing topic because it's not really a widespread model and it's kind of honestly a newer model of flying. Um, so leave any comments down below and I'll try my best to answer them. And next we're going on to part two, which is my training experience at both. So for my regional training, it was five weeks long with two non-consecutive days off. So basically two random days off that we did not know ahead of time as students. It took place in Salt Lake City, Utah which was a really fun time. I was there in the summertime and if you guys have been following me, you know I'm from Massachusetts and so being out in Utah of all places was just like crazy for me for over a month. It was a really, really cool experience to be able to be out in the desert that long. That was very cool. But anyways, so then my mainline training was six weeks long, but we also had most weekends off up until, until the very end and it took place here in SeaTac, Washington. And I'll actually link my um, mainline training playlist. I did weekly recaps, weekly reflections of my time and training at my mainline. So I'll link those in the cards up above if you are interested in checking that out if you're a prospective flight attendant. And I can say hands down that I had a better training experience as a student at my current airline. I feel like I was treated with way more respect and kindness at this training than I was at my regional. The teachers were very accessible, or the instructors I should say, were very accessible. If you had any extra questions about the curriculum or what we were learning, they always made themselves available. No question was a dumb question. I felt like we had more breaks. It felt more relaxing. I didn't feel like I was walking on eggshells and a, bo a ball of nerves all the time. And at my mainline training, we typically stuck to an eight to five daily schedule. Whereas at my regional, I felt like there was honestly an expectation that we were all going to fail. And I've talked to my friends about this and they've concurred like the same conclusions basically as I had. I kind of felt that there was this culture that if you made it through, which they did not expect anyone to make it through, then you were one of the lucky chosen ones. And so that was, and I'm just speaking from my experience, I'm sure other people have had different experiences, but I felt a lot, a lot, a lot of pressure to be perfect at my regional training. There was zero grace given. If you were like half a second late from a break, you were sent home. 
if you were a second late from the bus pickup time in the morning, you were sent home. If an instructor uh, wrote you up because they didn't like something you were wearing in class that day, you were sent home. They were, like, it was just all eyes on you and it was a very, very stressful experience. Um, it did feel kind of militant and I felt like I was constantly like looking over my shoulders to make sure like I was following the rules and being perfect and studying and you know participating in the conversations and everything like that. I was so stressed out actually that over the course of the five weeks I lost just over 10 pounds and I attribute that to a lack of sleep, a lack of nutrition because we had, you know, just those really tiny mini fridges in hotel rooms that are super, like the really small ones. We had no cooking equipment, no cooking appliances. I didn't have the money to be going out to eat. So I was trying to, you know, make peanut butter jelly sandwiches every day. <laughs> like training is difficult. I lost a lot of weight. Um, and also just like a lack of time to take care of myself because we were just go, 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 go. You never know when you were gonna have a day off. And also lastly, so with the regional training, to my recollection, my class times were about 10 to 12 hours. Some There was a few times, especially when we were doing heavy drill days, we would be pushing 12 to 14 hours days because we would fall behind because it was a pretty big class. Um, so depending on the day, it was like 10 to 12 hour long days. And then another thing that I think might be worth noting was that at my mainline training, mind you, if you followed my journey, you know that it took me quite a while to get a training date set with my current airline. I was pushed out almost a full year to get a training date. I recall that there was actually quite a few other trainees in my mainline training that had previous airline experience. And I was in that same boat so i would like to you know i would introduce myself and as i got to know them over the course of time um i found out where they were coming from why they were here i shared my story and it was just you know pretty typical that you would have people at mainline training with either regional or prior airline experience background at my regional training to my recollection i don't think any of us had at least in my training class, I don't think any of us had previous airline experience. Um, there is a misconception, going back to misconceptions, there is a misconception that you have to start at a regional to eventually go mainline. That is not true. Um, it is a popular path that a lot of people take, but by no means are you less qualified if you don't have regional flight attendant experience. I do think though that it might make you more of a shoe-in to um, you know, have a leg up at your face to face perhaps because if it was listed on your resume that you were previously a flight attendant, then the person recruiting you would say, oh, like this person has made it through training before, they understand the expectations upon them and they were successful. So, you know, they're gonna be a sure investment basically. So a lot of people do start regional and go mainline, but you don't have, if that's not for you, then you don't have to do it that way. Um, I just did it because I wanted to make sure that this was a career choice that I was ready for and I wanted to like dip my toes in before I committed to something much, much bigger. So next for part three, we're going to talk about IOEs slash OEs. So what that stands for is your initial operating experience or some airlines just call it your OE or your operating experience. So this is basically your final competency check before or after you earn your wings. It's literally your first time shadowing and then working as a flight attendant in the sky for the first time. And at my regional, you earned your wings uh, after graduating ground school. So it was like, even though you graduated ground school, you didn't get your wings yet. You had to go through your IOE, which was scheduled at a later date. I think mine was scheduled about four or five weeks after I graduated ground school. And mine ended up being a four day trip. And at my regional, I think, depending on the requirements, it was between, typically it was your IOE was between three and four days long. With regional jets, they either require one or two flight attendants. And to get your wings, you shadow the forward flight attendant position because there's only two. So there's a forward and an aft flight attendant and you have to shadow the forward. I really liked my instructor. She and I got along. She had We had great banter. She gave me awesome, little phrases to repeat to remember you know at this phase of flight remember to do this checklist because for me everything felt so foreign going from passenger to 
working the flight like you don't realize until you have to flip that switch how difficult at least in the beginning that that is to do because you're like you're so used to the flow of flight like you're so used to your crew knowing exactly what to do and to guide you through the flight that i was like oh my god like i have no clue what i'm doing and i just spent like five weeks on the ground learning this and i'm just like Whew. you know like the nerves got to me for sure but anyways um so i will never forget how nervous i was like quick little side story so i was so nervous that uh can't believe I'm sharing this on the internet, but my dad flew out to Denver to kind of like wish me well and like see me off before my trip started because he knew how nervous I was. And I was like shaking and crying so many times in the car. I was like, dad, what am I doing? Like, I'm crazy. Like, I, what did I sign up for? Like, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I have so much, I was so stressed out over the responsibility of being responsible for everyone in the airplane and I felt like such imposter syndrome and my dad calmed me down and he watches my videos so shout out dad because I know you're going to watch this. Um, that moment like it meant a lot to me so you don't know what you're capable of until you test yourself. I will say that. That instructor, her and I, we connected pretty well. She gave me tons of advice on my checklist and things that I could do to remember what I had to do as I made my way through the IOE experience. Flip side, my mainline OE, we just called it OE uh, where I am now. Your OEs for everybody took place during that very last week, that sixth week of training. And it was also a requirement to pass before you earned your wings at graduation. Um, so this, at my mainline, you do your OE before you graduate, whereas at my regional, you do your IOE after you graduated. And one thing I liked about at my mainline, you were partnered up with someone else from the class, and I think this was mostly just due to like the sheer size of the classes, but I liked it though because that means like, you know, I have another student in the same shoes as me that we can kind of bounce knowledge off of each other and just like support each other in that way, so I didn't feel as much pressure and I didn't feel as nervous at my main line going through my OE than I did at my regional. I also remember feeling that at my uh, main line, you have to shadow two positions, not just the one forward position at the regional. So at my main line, you shadow the A lead position and you also shadow the, I believe it's the B position, which is in the main cabin towards the back. So since there was two of us, uh, one of the students shadows one while the other is working with the other and then that's one way uh you know from for us it was seattle to wherever we were going and then on the way back to seattle we flip-flopped and the other student would shadow a and the other b as you make your way back to seattle i hope that makes sense so you kind of flip-flop between the two positions and i just remember feeling that this one was way 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 more hands off like before it was like my instructor with an iPad checking all these boxes as I did them and if I missed something it'd be like, hmm, what's, what's, uh, what's wrong here? And you'd have to like think on your feet and figure it out. And whereas at my main line, like my OE experience was so much more relaxed. I felt way more confident in my abilities and it wasn't as detailed and specific as uh, my regionals IOE. So it was definitely less, less, less stressful for sure. So now we are moving on to section four, which are the benefits. I have had multiple people comment asking questions about like, how much are you paid? How does the pay work? Pay specific questions are going to be an entirely other video because it is just such a convoluted topic and it's complex and hard to explain because it is such a unique industry. I'm going to be speaking in broader strokes and broader concepts about benefits but generally speaking overall i am paid more at my main line than at my regional carrier it isn't as much as you might think though that is because we are in the midst of contract negotiations and so there is a lot going on in the background so i'm not going to speak too much on that topic but in general yes i am paid more at my main line than my regional from a reserve standpoint i get special reserve units of pay just for being a reserve classification instead of a line holder. So I get additional pay just for that reason alone than I did at my regional. We also have a higher per diem than I was making before. We have the A position pay, which is our lead flight attendant on our flights. They get paid more. We have higher pay for the airport standby shifts. So here it's 
five for five, so you get paid five units for five hours of pay, whereas at my regional, I was doing, and if you watched my st spend standby videos with me, like, you know, because some of, those are some of my, still my most popular videos, I was doing, at my regional, eight hour shifts of standby and only paid four units of pay for eight hours of work. So yes, I know, make your own inferences from that information as you will. I didn't make the industry, I just work in it. So that was a rule at my previous regional. But in terms of other financial benefits, generally speaking, I actually have a higher 401k match at my mainline airline than I ever did at my regional. We also get uh, quarterly and yearly performance bonuses depending on how our airline meets its goals throughout the year and throughout the quarters. That's kind of specific to my airline. I think every airline has its own kind of bonus programs if they have them at all. We did not have bonus structures to my knowledge at my previous regional. That is something that I do look forward to here because it actually does make a difference in my paychecks. Other benefits, um, I get a yearly allotment of money to put towards uniform pieces, whereas previously I had to pay out of pocket for every uniform piece. And that's just really nice to know that I'm pretty much never going to have to pay out of pocket for my work uniforms. We also get an additional benefit for medical grade compression tights and it works through your health insurance and your doctor's office and you get a literal prescription for uh, compression tights that are medical grade. And through this program for us, we get between 10 and 12 pairs a year. You get a free pair of orthotics every year, a free pair of uniform compliant shoes each year. It's a really great program. And I did not have that at my regional and I was spending so much money on tights, especially if you like to wear the skirts and the dresses, you're gonna go through tights like crazy. And especially when you're working a lot of legs, like I was at my regional, the most legs I did in a day was like six legs. There's just a ton of sharp objects and sharp corners on airplanes. So you're gonna snag a tight, you're gonna rip something, you're gonna, I don't know, brush up against some Velcro or something on the plane and you're just gonna ruin your tights. So that is something that has added up over time for me and I'm basically not spending money on tights anymore, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Next, let's talk about flight benefits. Within my first six months at my mainline, I did not have access to my flight benefits on other carriers yet. Um, that is because at least with most mainlines, I can't speak for all, but for most, uh, you have to get through your first six months and then you have access to your flight benefits on other carriers. My flight benefits on my own carrier and our regional started from day one after graduating ground school. I remember at my regional, I had really good flight benefits through all the other four carriers that were contracted with that regional. I'm pretty sure there was a select few. I think I had to pay a hundred or $200 yearly fee or bi-yearly. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I basically had to pay like a yearly fee to have access to the flight benefits and they were at a decent priority level for standby travel um, for me, my family members, etc., to fly on the four mainline carriers. And I had access to the flight load information of all those four carriers. So that made it a lot easier to plan flying around. Honestly, like looking back on it, I would say my flight benefits are basically the same. I feel like any airline you go to, you're gonna have different agreements on different airlines. Like if I was married and had children, they would have the same priority level as me as an employee on all other air carriers to my knowledge. Um, it's just my, my parents and my sister who are on my benefits that are not the same priority level as me because they're more like extended family. Whereas like if you're married or have a domestic partner and children, those are like direct relations, direct same priority as you. But all in all, I would say my flight benefits are roughly the same. Some of the rules are a little different, but I have not yet had a problem getting to where I'm trying to go on a carrier yet. So pretty much even Steven there. So now we're on to part five of the video, which is my one year reflection between regional and mainline and which I prefer, where I'm at and my experience so far. So to start, I am glad that I went mainline when I did, even though many of the airlines right now, at least in the US are 
in contract negotiations, which puts a strain on things. Even with things as they are right now, the work rules as they are right now are just so much better than at my regional. That means a lot. That was basically the main reason I left. I was a zombie. I was just, you know, I was ready for more. I just was feeling beat down and low energy at the end of every trip. And I just, I don't know, I was ready for change already. Right now at my main line, I have way better minimum rest rules. And yes, this does matter. Like it is a very specific thing to talk about, but let's face it. I was flying 20 to 25 year old airplanes that constantly had maintenance issues. And I was based in Denver, Colorado. And if you know Denver, Denver has a lot of storms, especially in the springtime. Like the weather can just change on a dime. You're getting delays due to mechanical. You're getting delays due to weather delays because of a delay because of a delay and slowly that makes your duty day so long and then you're bordering into minimum rest territory and my previous minimum rest I can't even remember what it was I want to say it was like eight and a half to nine hours per the FAA but now it's bare minimum ten and a half and to me like it doesn't seem like much, but that makes such a big difference. That was just one thing for me personally because like I am someone who needs to sleep and it's a safety sensitive job and you need to be well rested to be able to make critical decisions, you know? So that was really, really, really huge for me. Another thing I wanna reflect on are my layovers. I have been tending to enjoy my layovers a lot more at my main line than at my regional, but don't get me wrong, I loved being based in Colorado. I loved my Colorado mountain towns and, you know, getting to spend my New Year's Eve in Aspen, Colorado was such a treat. Like, there are certain little things that made it special and I'll know, I know I'll never have some of those niche opportunities at a main line, but overall though, I'm looking more so at 18 to 24 hour layovers now and in places that I find to be more exciting and more fulfilling to me personally. I go to New York City a lot and I have lots of friends and family who are still there and I get to see them whenever I go and I go to Hawaii a lot. I'll link up in the cards some of my Hawaii layovers up above and you can see what I'm talking about. I've even had a 30 hour layover in Sitka, Alaska, which is beyond beautiful. And I love that layover. So I am very happy with the de destinations that we fly to. Like I was saying about rest, when you have a longer layover, that also gives you more time to sleep and rest and recover before you have to fly back home. So that's huge for me too. Having longer layovers means you can sleep in and it's not being lazy. It's like your body actually needs the sleep. So I find now that I am way less of a zombie unless I'm doing like back-to-back -back red eyes, which honestly does not happen very often at all. I find that I'm not a zombie when I get home and that's super important to me. Another thing that I wanna talk about, which is very specific to the regional world, is that I do not miss flying on our CRJ200 aircraft where if you don't know the aircraft, it is a small 50-seater plane where there is only one flight attendant controlling and working the whole flight in the cabin. And per the FAA, when you have 50 passenger seats, all you need is one flight attendant. Like, that's the rule. Any If you have 51, then you need two flight attendants. Basically, one flight attendant per 50 seats on a plane. So, for me, I personally don't think it's very safe because... I just think of the what ifs and what if something happened to me in my jump seat and what if the passengers don't notice that maybe I'm having like a medical episode in my jump seat and I can't communicate anymore. Then who's going to call the flight deck to call the pilots and let them know, hey, there's something wrong with the flight attendant. We need to land. So for me personally, I just think from a safety standpoint, I was never very comfortable flying on the 200s. You just never know the what ifs and that's just my own beliefs. But that being said, I could fully handle myself on a 200. I could do all my announcements. I can say my entire safety demo. I can do a full service all by myself. I can run flights by myself and I have, but I don't miss it. <laughs> um, and I will say that, especially on our two flight attendant aircraft, I do miss having my own galley space. Like if I was the forward or the aft, you know, we each have our own galleys, we set up our own, we have our own workflows. Um, we can, you know, the forward is working first class and then the aft is working the main cabin. 
and for that you find a good workflow you work together as a team when you need to and you can you know hand off tasks but you also get your separate space and you can just chill and I don't know the introvert in me misses that I guess <laughs> and another thing I want to bring up is that in this industry and everyone says it and it's true is that you know don't take anything to heart because things are always changing and it is so true i am excited to see where this career takes me and who knows what's in store in the future so my point being i see more of a growth opportunity in my current airline than at my regional i didn't really see myself you know growing that much in my career or seeing my routes change whereas now the future is just who knows it's uncharted territory and that's something that you know, it can be nerve wracking, but I find it to be kind of exciting. But lastly, last thing I want to reflect on is after one year of flying at both a regional based out of Denver and my mainline based out of Seattle, I'll say Seattle doesn't feel like home yet at all. And I know that's going to take time because I know you guys can probably tell if you followed along on my journey, you know that I fly back to Denver a lot. And that's because I made some friends there that, and just some really strong relationships there. So I fly back often, but I know it's gonna take time. And I've heard that, <laughs> and I don't like stereotypes, but I've heard that it takes time to warm up to Seattle lights. And I can say that that has been my experience. And also I work in the airline business. So it's like you meet somebody for the first time and then you might not see them again for like six months, a year, five years, who knows? So. It is taking some time. I have made some friends, I have. But the friends that I've made, I've found are a lot of commuters, so they don't stay in Seattle very long. So anyways, my point being like, I'm excited that I moved here and I'm establishing myself here, but I know it's gonna take time for it to feel like home. And that is another thing that I've noticed is that with the airline that I'm currently at, a lot of the people I fly with are like Pacific Northwest locals or natives or they're just native to the West Coast in general. And it's like, anytime I meet someone new, they're always like, wow, why are you here? Because they'll be like, oh, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Massachusetts, the East Coast. And they're like, what, what are you doing here? Why aren't you at this airline, that airline, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, pause. Like, I'm always down for an adventure. You guys know, if you follow my journey, you know I've done two cross country road, road trips in my life so far. I. Prior to my channel, when I was still in school, I spent a semester in London abroad and I lived there for a while. Like, I've kind of been a nomad for a while. So it always kind of pulls me back when I realize I'm dealing with people who've like been here their whole life. And I'm simply not that case. Like I've traveled around more times than not in my life. So that just about wraps up my reflections. That's gonna wrap up the video, you guys. Uh, I hope I cleared some things up. I know this was a highly requested video. Um, if there's anything that needs more clarification, go ahead and leave a comment down below. I love talking about flying with you guys. And if I can clear anything up for you, I'm all ears. I will definitely answer down below. Um, thank you again so much for watching and subscribing. It does mean a lot. And there's a few of you that I see regularly in my comment section and just know that I look forward to your thoughts and I'm curious what you guys think of my videos. So please, if you are not already subscribed, please like, comment, share, or subscribe to the channel. It really does help my channel grow. And please let me know also down below what other kind of content you wanna see. I do a variety of vlogs and lifestyle vlogs, obviously travel vlogs and layover diaries. Um, I do some of these sit downs where I talk more about just the flight attendant career path and aviation in general. Let me know if there's anything you really want to see and I'll try to fit it in and we'll keep on growing the channel. With that, I'm going to sign off here and take care of yourselves, guys. I'll see you in the sky. Bye.